Welcome back, everyone. My name is Michael LeBlanc, Senior uh, Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Junior Wealth Management, and thanks for joining us this week. Um, again, uh, for those of you who don't join us or watch us or listen to us regularly, uh, hopefully this is coming through. Uh, as you can see by my away background, I'm not in our normal office. Actually, our office is under renovation for the next few weeks, so uh, bear with me as uh, I know the sound quality in this uh, the temporary area is not as good as we normally have, but uh, hopefully it will get through fine. Uh, but with that, as always, let's uh, let's jump into things. Uh, keep in mind, everything we cover in these videos are for information purposes only. Always do your own due diligence or reach out to us. Go to mikeonmoney.com. Let us know your thoughts, any questions you have, or if you want to take a look at your particular situation and how any of the uh, concepts or information we cover in these uh, might pertain to your your financial plan or investment portfolio. So with that, let's just touch base on COVID. Uh, the only real thing I'm going to talk about COVID is uh, reopening plans. Uh, you know, Californians announcing you know to end uh, mask requirements and, and passports. Saskatchewan's talking about it. Quebec's talking about it. Uh, more and more provinces and countries around the world. Last week we mentioned in Europe, there's a lot of European um, countries lifting mandates and even list, lifting testing requirements for travel. Uh, so from that standpoint, all good news or good news. Uh, you know, hopefully you know, safe news, hopefully returning to normal, uh, or at least things going in the direction of, of normalcy as we come out of the Omicron kind of uh, wave or, or, or infection wave. Uh, probably you're like me. Uh, I now, I think I know more people that have had uh, COVID now that haven't had COVID. We kind of went through this big rush uh, over the last few months of people uh, getting it. Luckily, um, uh, no severe cases that I know of, or personally know of, uh, so, uh, so so that's also good news. Uh, obviously, there's still protests and, and things going on. Uh, I did talk about it last week. I'm not really going to talk about it this week because a lot of these things, um, rightfully or wrongfully, are based more on opinion than fact, um, or, or people's opinions or interpretations of partial facts in, in, in the sense that we don't have all the information to, to maybe have all the answers. Uh, so I don't wanna pit one side or the other side uh, for opinion. I think what we're seeing globally right now, uh, and I do mean globally, not just in Canada, uh, I, I think what we're seeing is kind of people, people are at their end, people have got, gotten vaccinated, uh, you know, they're getting their boosters, uh, and they're just hoping to, you know, see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and, and hopefully with these reopenings, we will kind of get to that, uh, that people will be safe and this will have run its course and we won't have to go uh, back into lockdown. I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't want to get your hopes up because we did see it kind of end of last year, kind of October, November, looking like things were going to be good. And then, of course, we went into a new wave uh, with, uh, with the new variant. So... This time, this time around, keeping our fingers crossed. But that's all I'm going to cover on COVID uh, as far as the updates go this week. So with that, let's take a look at what's going on out in the world of economics. Uh, U.S. trade numbers for December are due out this week. Uh, Canada trade uh, numbers for December are coming out. So let's keep a close eye on those. Uh, we continue with earnings season. Uh, Pfizer's reporting. We'll talk a little bit more about Pfizer. There's a lot going on there. KKR, Holly, Harley Davidson is going to be reporting. They had a really, Harley Davidson actually, much like any recreational vehicle um, market company uh, through uh, the pandemic has, has, has done well. So we're looking to see how that's held up, you know, as we come to the tail end of this. Uh, are we going to continue to see people's interest in recreational vehicles? Or was that kind of just a, uh, a pandemic thing where, you know, people are going to go back to whatever they did before? Uh, Warner Music Group is looking to uh, to uh, uh, announce, uh, lift uh, the uh, the car, um, the, <laughs> the car, the taxi service, basically, uh, like Uber, if you're not familiar with Lyft, uh, Chipotle, Mexican Grill, and of course, Peloton. So we'll talk a bit more about Peloton. It's It's been in the news a lot lately over a lot of different things, and we'll, we'll dive into that. So the stock futures this morning were up a bit uh, early Tuesday as investors are a bit more optimistic. You know, they're waited for, you know, another uh, more 
more good earning reports coming out uh, and also looking uh, at the trade deficits that we're, we're uh, hopefully to see for the December numbers again in the US. So a little bit of optimism this morning, but I will say one thing, you know, we, we've definitely been rolled back and forth since January, even in December, this kind of started September, October. It's definitely in the tech side. It's now coming in uh, to the broader markets. We're seeing volatility, uh, you know, all around the rate height uh, expectations uh, coming up, um, you know, as early as March, um, and, and and how many and how much those rate hikes are going to be. So if you're out there, I'll tell you right now. I'll you know spend most of my day pretty much reading different opinions, different reports. Uh, you know what's going to be happening in the market, what's going to happen first quarter, what's going to happen second quarter, what's going to happen for the rest of the year, and I'm, and and really we're we're getting to a split, uh, which basically means no one really knows uh, what's going to shape up here. Are we going to uh, continue to be in a growth market, a, a bull market? Uh, are we going to see uh, some sort of major pullback, even temporarily? Uh, it, it's really coming to the fine line. And, and my advice to you, if you're out there and you're following this stuff or you're concerned or you want to take advantage of the pullbacks, reach out to us. Uh, or if you're doing it, uh, you know, if, if you're making some of your own calls, uh, I'd be very cautious in this environment. Now, it doesn't mean go to cash and it doesn't mean go all in. If you follow me, you, you know it, 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 it's a very tempered approach. We have been raising cash in the portfolios, uh, moving uh, out of positions that are presenting more volatility than they should. So, you know, we, we have uh, volatility data on every position, volatility data compared to its its sector, volatility data, data compared to um, the, the indexes, and that's both for individual positions and ETFs. Uh, and what we really look for is uh, companies that are showing, or, or sorry, positions that are showing more volatility than they normally should. Those are the ones that are going to be at, at the biggest risk, and those are the ones you're, you're likely to experience a bigger pullback in uh, in your portfolio. So we're lighting up on those positions. Uh, we're favoring the ones that are keeping volatility low or at least below or at their normal levels compared to their, their sector or to their index. Um, and making sure that, uh, you know, we have less you know, that less up and down in the portfolios. And that gives us that cash to take advantage of those pullback days, which will be there. Uh, and we'll be able to jump on some, some really quality names uh, at, at cheap discounts. So that doesn't mean we've got, we've pulled away from the market completely. We've just pulled away from certain positions, whether lightening them up or uh, removing them temporarily uh, while we get through some of this volatility. So take a look at your portfolios or reach out to us. Uh, happy to walk you through uh, any positions you have uh, and take a look at how they're, they're currently reacting uh, in the markets right now. Uh, so also, sorry, some more insights, uh, what's going on in the market. Uh, Trump's Truth Social app talked a little bit about this in the past. You know, Trump uh, did a, a SPAC deal um, in 2021, raised billions of dollars to start his own, basically supposed to be a competition to Twitter. Will it be hard to say? Uh, certainly, the hype around it, um, you know, seems larger than life. Uh, hard, hard for them to deliver on the claims that they uh, that they expect to have. Uh, you know, part of this is you know uh, Trump doesn't has been banned for most of the social media apps, so he's looking for one he can be on. Uh, they're looking to offer you know kind of a non. Um, uh, non vetted or non uh, reviewed commentary which you know different uh, different platforms that have tried to do this in the past have run into a lot of trouble because you know uh you know the, the trump might be creating this in order so for him or his his followers to uh express their views and their opinions uh but what it, it tends to also attract is extremists in different areas that you know start to express their opinions and their views that can get out of control really quickly without having that moderation uh, of, of some of the content to make sure uh, you know the real real extreme views or the dangerous views we've even seen uh, terrorist groups use these types of things in the past so who knows it's supposed to come out in the next couple of weeks 
Um, they're having a bit of trouble right now with big tech companies like Apple and Google because they do have rules to be on their platform uh, in their stores for people to download this, these apps. Uh, there are certain rules that have to be uh, followed or have to fit in with the guidelines. And it's not, uh, it, you know, these guidelines have been in place for years. So it's not something that was created to impede uh, the true social app, simply uh, the true social app as it currently stands, doesn't meet all the guidelines. So we'll keep a close eye on that. It's supposed to come out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've seen some partnerships uh, start to happen with uh, Rumble, which is another platform that's kind of unmoderated and has some extreme views on there. So we'll keep a close eye and uh, see where that leads to. Um, Unreal demand and irregular sales worth billions are firing up the wild NFT market. So I haven't talked too much about the NFTs. Uh, we've talked about crypto, uh, although NFTs are different. Um, they, they do work on the blockchain and they kind of uh, were born out of crypto, uh, the crypto markets. So NFTs stand in for non-fungible tokens. I'm not going to get into a long explanation on them here. Uh, um, if I have enough interest, you know, people reach out, I'll do a, a separate video on it. Uh, but basically think of it as a unique digital um, ownership. So it kind of started with artwork. So if you had, if you, if you painted an original, uh, if you did the Mona Lisa, you have the Mona Lisa hangs on your wall, you have that original. There might be many copies of the Mona Lisa out there, but the original Mona Lisa hanging in the Louvre, that's the original. And NFT is an, uh, is an original digital uh, content that uh, is coded, non-fungible token on the blockchain saying that you own the original. Yes, someone can just copy it on their screen and they have a pretty much the same copy of it, but you have proof that you own the original. So we've seen this being used for art, uh, for questionable art. I won't get into my opinions around board apes or any of these other things, uh, music, uh, all kinds of things uh, that, that live in the digital world. So um, basically, uh, we've got this trading platform, an auction platform that you can buy and sell these things. Uh, and, and the price, it has been crazy, the, the, the dollar values. We've seen, you know, uh, what looks like just a made up cartoon piece, uh, you know, going for hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to the millions of dollars. And just recently, uh, you, there was a, uh, a, 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 new, uh, uh, a, a new piece of uh, NFT, uh, which was a computer generated pixelated person uh, sold for about $50.6 million worth of cryptocurrency. Uh, but only uh, shortly afterwards, it was sold back to the original seller for 49.6 million. So this is actually driving, driving a lot of concerns and rumors of you know, potential money laundering uh, in, this, in these things. Uh, NFTs are still, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of uh, marketing going around these things, but there's still very, very, very few people involved in buying and selling nfts you know when we look at it as a, as a market as a whole there might be big dollars changing hands but very few people uh, actually involved and we've seen a lot of scams a lot of frauds happening a lot of people losing millions and millions of dollars uh, on these as well so caution you if you are interested in nfts reach out to us uh, reach out to me at michaelmoney.com happy to um, dive into them further but also be very cautious if you're if you're going to go and uh, you know start playing in that market. Make sure you understand uh, what and who you're getting involved with. So on that, let's move on to more economic news. Uh, U.S. on the road to a 1950 style unemployment, um, but it may only be a pit stop. So the unemployment rate, you know, is approaching um, you know kind of three percent. You know, last time we saw that uh, was back in the 50s. Uh, right before uh, a massive recession. So, you know, as I talked earlier uh, today, uh, all, all data now is showing we could have a nice soft land in here, uh, or we could go into a, a much bigger pullback in the markets and the economy. So uh, things are kind of on the cusp. I've actually seen some, some probability numbers. And for the first quarter this year, uh, the predictions are, you know, only 46% we might go into a bigger pullback. So, you know, not over the majority mark. Like I said, it's right down the middle. Uh, I've actually seen second quarter uh, numbers uh, in the 80 percentile that will have a bigger pullback. Now, those are, you know, a bit further out to really see if uh, 
they can come true. They can change drastically as we go through the uh, through the earnings season. Uh, and again, they could be wrong. We are on a fence here, and uh, I think it's time to definitely be cautious. Uh, Pfizer, uh, Spiver, Pfizer's COVID cash file opens opportunities for deals. So basically, Pfizer, as I mentioned, is reporting uh, their earnings. They did report this morning, um, and uh, they were good, uh, but un, you know, uninspiring, basically. So Pfizer stock pulled back just slightly today, you know, less than 1%, um, but on a green day. So it's a going against the market. Uh, basically, you know, through this uh, pandemic, they, they, they've obviously been the, at the forefront as far as the preferred, if you want to call it that, uh, uh, vaccination brand. Uh, so they pulled in a lot of cash and a lot of money, and that's going to continue through 2022 with boosters. And of course, the rest of the world is still getting vaccinated. Uh, we in North America tend to look at it and think, oh, you know, we're at the tail end, but a lot of countries are still uh, early stages. Uh, so they have this big stockpile and shareholders are really looking to see what they're going to do with this. You know, is there a deal out there for them to have? Can they buy, expand or change uh, what they're doing? How are they going to create earnings uh, for 2023 and, and, and beyond? So, uh, so the earnings kind of came out. They were completely in line with what everyone expected, but just uninspiring as to what they were going to do with all this cash. So we'll have to keep a keep a closer eye on Pfizer, but still good news as far as earnings goes for them. Crypto firms uh, are launching a coalition to try to uh, promote uh, market integrity. So again, if you're in the crypto market um, or the blockchain market. Uh, Basically, we've seen more and more and more fraud happening um, to, to basically steal coins, to just steal money from people. Um, you know, there's the rug pull scam where, you know, a new coin is set up. Uh, people go in and buy it, buy into it, uh, only to have the, the initial uh, creators of the coin pull all your money out and take, you know, take it out and the coin goes to zero because there's no capital behind it anymore. Uh, we, we've seen uh, scams on different platforms like Discord saying, oh, here, buy into this, into our group. And, uh, you know, that inadvertently you're giving them access to your um, crypto wallet where they go in and take all your coins out of your wallet. Um, the, the list is endless. Uh, the, there's, there's been millions and millions and millions just just in the last few months alone. So uh, some of the bigger players are out there trying to legitimize the market, trying to bring some integrity to it, trying to bring some standards. So we'll keep an eye, see where that leads to. It's obviously uh, counterintuitive to what cryptocurrency and blockchain is um, in the sense that it's designed not to be regulated, it's designed to be an open market. Uh, so it becomes very, very hard to kind of control that. And we've talked about that with central banks wanted to put more um, rules and regulations around crypto and, and it kind of defeats, defeats what the original purpose of it was. So we'll have to see how that evolves. Uh, White House is releasing a labor report seeking to boost uh, union memberships. Basically, uh, they're out there, uh, to, did a report, did, did, had a committee uh, do a lot of research around um, labor task force. Uh, and they're coming out with 70 recommendations of how the government can help workers uh, join labor unions and bargain collectively. And this is kind of coming out of the pandemic where it really highlighted, highlighted a lot of the working class or the kind of what, what we ended up deemed being essential workers, uh, you know, whether, whether it comes to minimum wage uh, not being adequate or benefits uh, protections uh, are not being adequate. Uh, so the government's kind of looking at how can they improve those situations without, you know, disrupting too much when it comes to economic growth. Uh, and uh, so they want to help try to guide that group, guide those groups to better conditions, but at the same time, uh, good for business owners as well. U.S. Senate Democrats uh, are pressing J.P. Morgan for more details on their debt collection practices. So no big surprise through the, the pandemic, there's been a lot of default on debt, especially credit cards. Uh, so J.P. Morgan just being one, um, one of those particular uh, creditors uh, who will be, you know, obviously the first of many uh, that the, uh, the Senate will, will likely uh, take a look at to see how they're treating them. Um, much like when we talk about eviction rates and things like that, which we've covered in the past, 
you you have to make sure when there's a when there's a higher number than normal defaults happening due to this broad economic uh, position. It's a bit of a domino effect, though. You know, the harder and harder you push to collect or, or, or push on people, you know, that pushes to the next level and then the next level and the next level. And all of a sudden, you can have this collapse of certain areas of the economy. So the Senate's kind of taking a look, see how credits are approaching this, and see if there's not a way to make it work for everybody or at least ease, ease the pressures on, the, um, on that area of the economy. Let's take a look at what's coming up this week and what we see going on. As I mentioned, Pfizer's fourth corners are out. Uh, they've got their antiviral pill, which is doing really well. Amgen, who worked up with them on the, the vaccines, also uh, announcing uh, or coming out with their long-term business outlook. So all good there, just really looking for, for something more, uh, something more uh, inventive to do with all this um, increase in revenue. Uh, Peloton, if you haven't been following Peloton's story, so or, or back that up, maybe you don't even uh, aren't even aware Peloton is. So Peloton was the company, uh, fitness company that kind of came to the forefront at the beginning of the pandemic. So they sell that expensive, um, expensive uh, exercise bike and treadmills, uh, where you subscribe and you have you know video online trainers uh, that you can do classes uh, ranging from the bike to workouts to outdoors, all kinds of things. Uh, so obviously with all the gyms being closed and people being cooped up, uh, Peloton shot up uh, as the shining star uh, in, in that environment. And we saw Amazon jump on afterwards with their own Amazon Fitness and Apple Fitness and, and other ones, uh, NordaTrack, a bunch of other ones kind of came out afterwards. Well, in recent months, Peloton's, you know, kind of coming under a lot of fire because they went out and built up production. They built up staff, planning on that growth rate that they saw during the pandemic to continue. And obviously, maintaining that higher growth rate was not sustainable. It had to slow. Didn't mean it fell off completely, but it had to slow. Uh, they've had a couple of controversies with uh, sitcoms, uh, TV shows, um, you know, showing their product being used while, you know, older. And for some reason, they're picking on men having heart attacks on the bikes while, you know, while they're working out on them and all these things have kind of uh, piled on. Uh, there was also Blackwell's Capital uh, started, you know, buying in the, uh, the, the, uh, the stock as it was coming down. Um, and it became a very vocal, uh, larger shareholder pushing for the, the, uh, the ousting of the CEO, John Foley. Uh, so this morning, uh, they actually announced uh, there is a shakeup in management. A Foley is, is, is leaving, uh, and they're laying off about 2,800 workers. Uh, they're saying it's not going to impact any of their, their, their current services. They're just kind of cutting back probably what they should have been cutting back over the last year, just in a more controlled manner. So a big shakeup. But the stock's actually performing really well today after uh, you know several weeks, months of, of, of coming down. Um, where rumors now that Amazon or Nike might make a play to buy it out. So it, it, it has a good instructor, uh, sorry, infrastructure. It has a very large um, subscriber base, which uh, subscriber bases are, you know, uh, basically fixed cash flow or not guaranteed fixed cash flow, but uh, reoccurring cash flow. And, uh, you know, if, if, if a large company in Nike or Amazon, who's already built up their own, can add those to their, their current subscribers, that's a big win, uh, for, you know, for a company. So there is still a lot of good value there. Obviously, a lot of challenges around the company as they try to restructure. And we'll have to see how the potential uh, buyouts play out here. Lyft, as I mentioned, is expected to uh, post another profitable quarter as the revenue returns, as people get out more, as things reopen, and uh, people are using their services on a more regular basis. Uh, we already talked about uh, uh, Peloton and the Amazon and Nike interest, and it's only early interest right now. There's no official bids out there that we've seen. Uh, Tesla is receiving a subpoena. Um, why is Tesla always in the news about subpoena and the U.S. securities regulators? Uh, basically, this goes back to 2018. If you, you remember back in 2018, Elon Musk uh, and Tesla came to an agreement with the Securities Commission after uh, he had put out some material tweets. Uh, at the time, it was about potentially taking Tesla private, um, you know, which material change or material information about a company that can affect the stock is supposed to be vetted and put out in a controlled manner. 
Uh, and, and of course, that wasn't done, and it wasn't ended up not being true. Uh, the you know the Tesla was not being taken private. So the uh, so the securities regulators uh, came after Elon and Tesla, uh, and they came to an agreement that amongst fines and 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 Elon stepping down from one of his roles, um, that uh, all his tweets would be vetted by a committee or someone on the board, people on the board to make sure that if, especially if they're material information, um, that they were accurate and appropriate. And he continues to tweet. So, you know, there's a new, uh, there's a subpoena to kind of review that agreement and see if it's been violated. On the big airline uh, news front, uh, Frontier is to buy Spirit Airlines for a $2.9 billion uh, deal to bring the two budget carriers together. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're a traveler, um, or you follow, uh, you know, news uh, at all, you'll know that Frontier and Spirit, especially Spirit, don't have the greatest reputation, um, but very similar to what you'd see in Ryanair in, in Europe, uh, where, you know, it's discount. So if you get on, if you want to print a boarding pass, it costs you more money. If you want to bring a piece of luggage, it costs you more money. It just basically things cost you more money. There's very, very leg room, uncomfortable flights. Uh, but they're cheap, so they do uh, serve an area of the market. So this is an interest in play. Frontier is taking out Spirit, so we don't know exactly what the uh, the new name is going to be. Maybe uh, the the Spirit of the Frontier. Who knows? Uh, and we and we still don't know about the new management. Very likely, Frontier will take the forefront on the management side of things. Um, and this, you know, this will create the fifth largest carrier in the United the United States behind the majors. Uh, so we'll have to see how that affects those cheaper fares because we left less competition at that level. Maybe they'll be able to increase uh, increase revenues or increase uh, ticket prices um, without uh, kind of dropping their uh, their client bases. Uh, price, price Runner is suing Google for 2.1 billion euros. So someone else is piling on to the lawsuits, the, uh, the antitrust lawsuits on Google, Facebook, Microsoft, pretty much all the majors. Uh, so this is another one out of Europe, and it's basically uh, Price Runner is one of these um, these sites either do price comparison when you're shopping, uh, and they're just alleging that uh, Google is manipulating the results uh, that that they're getting out of the search engine uh, to favor Google over Price Runner. So uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. It's just uh, one of numerous antitrust lawsuits out there. Uh, New York pen pension officials are worried about misinformation uh, and seek Spotify to kind of report on it. So we talked about this last week. If you follow the Joe Rogan Spotify issue, which is actually blowing up to bigger and bigger and bigger issues about misinformation on the Spotify platform. Um, we'll get too much into that. Basically, New York uh, officials are looking for clarity around Spotify's rules uh, and how they're going to uh, you know, monitor that content. Um, so it's a wait and see. Spotify did kind of come out this morning and say, you know, they're, 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 uh, you know, commented more on the fact that they paid Joe Rogan a hundred million dollars to be exclusive on their platforms to do, they own that content. And, and now they're getting the backlash. So now they, they've committed a hundred million dollars to, um, other, uh, other artists, um, and, and groups, um, that have less repetition. Less, less representation or uh, less opportunity for representation on the platform uh, and, uh, and try to build out a more evenly balanced um, uh, offering on, on their platform. So this is kind of ongoing and it's kind of spiraling to everyone taking a side. But really at the end of the day, I don't know what much is gonna change other than the fact that you know a bunch of people are going to say sorry uh, other people might change a little bit and other things will just continue. Oops. On the uh, on the, the, the dollar front, um, you know, the job data that we're seeing will definitely help the U.S. dollar continue to build on its recent gains. Uh, it's definitely held in firm against European currencies. Uh, definitely, you know, the, the, the yen and the free Swiss franc are likely going to be the biggest losers against the uh, the U.S. dollars uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, basically, what we're looking at this year, I've had the question a few times when it comes to currency, 
uh, in rising interest rate market, especially when the U.S. is leading the interest rate hikes, um, the U.S. currency is going to do well. That being said, the Canadian dollar actually is showing trading a bit of a bit of a discount. Some modeling kind of has the Canadian dollar in around the 87 percent or 87 cent valuation. You know, not trading at that level. It's trading around 83. But you the Canadian dollar tends to always trade at a bit of discount to its fair valuation against the U.S. So that will likely continue, although there is some strength arm arguments for the Canadian dollar. Uh, but really what you want to watch for the Canadian dollar compared to the U.S. is uh, is the price of oil. As long as we can kind of stay above uh, 75 or so um, dollars a barrel, the Canadian dollar should hang in pretty strong against the U.S. even as it strengthens here. Uh, but if we see oil later this year break down below that 75 a barrel, um, then we can have some challenges. Now, if you follow us, uh, we're going to cover oil here in a little bit. You know, I'm a little bit bullish on the shorter term price of oil anyway. Uh, the yield on the 10 year benchmark uh, rose to 1.94, uh, put it on the highest level of closing since 2019, uh, settling in Monday about 1.91. Again, if you followed us since last year, I mentioned if we get through the 1.86 mark, um, you know, that's where we're going to see hikes. And we're definitely through that. And we're 100% expected hikes in the next uh, in the next few weeks. On the commodity front, oil uh, did go a little bit lower, broke through the $90 a barrel, held in around 89 and change, uh, but still showing strength. I'm seeing reports out there calling for $100 a barrel, uh, you know, in the shorter term. Still a lot of demand versus, uh, versus supply, uh, and it continues to move there. Uh, base metals fell a little bit in Europe. Aluminum is still holding up. Uh, but base metals are still doing quite well. We do still like gold. Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've put gold back into the portfolios uh, after a lackluster year uh, around gold last year, uh, which should have done well. Don't get me wrong. If you did hold gold last year, uh, it, you know, with all the inflation we saw, it should have done well. But with the lack of interest in, in, in raising the, the interest rates, uh, it just didn't perform. Now that we're starting to see interest rates, uh, uh, you know, in imminently starting to move, uh, you know, gold is starting to pick up some traction and should definitely be there as a hedge uh, as we head into a, a real inflationary market. So with that, that's what we have for you this week. Thanks very much for, for joining us. As always, go to mikeonmoney.com with any of your questions, any of your feedback, love to hear from you. Other than that, I will talk to you next week. Uh, and thanks again for joining and listening to us. Take care. Bye-bye.